and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah, and thanks for joining us for our latest fortnightly episode. Today's episode is the highlights of our latest Cicerone Live event. If you'd like to join our next event, you can find all the details at www.cicerone.co.uk forward slash live. Hello. Welcome to Cicerone Live. I'm Joe Williams, and thanks for joining us tonight for this uh, this special live event. So tonight we're talking about winter climbing, and specifically about Cicerone's new winter climbing in Benavis and Glencoe guidebook. So our guest tonight is Mike Pescod, um, who's the author of this new edition of, uh, of the Winter Climbing Guide. So Mike's got 27 years of climbing experience uh, on Ben Nevis, and, uh, and he's been working for 22 years as a mountain guide uh, in the Loch Aber area and, uh, and across Scotland. It was amazing to read that Mike has been climbing on Ben Nevis over a thousand times and that he uh, tends to average 100 days of winter climbing uh, every single winter. It was just uh, amazing compared to somebody like, my, like myself that might manage five days per winter. But, but Mike's got extensive climbing experience elsewhere. He's been on climbing trips across Europe and the rest of the world. He's climbed in Russia, Tajikistan, Nepal, East Africa and Peru. But Mike always says there's something about the quality of the climbing in Scotland that makes it the most enjoyable and, uh, and satisfying. Mike runs with his wife Louise, a successful mountain guiding company called Abagus uh, Mountain Guides, and they're based up in, uh, in Fort William. Uh, so I think it's probably about time to, uh, to bring in Mike. Welcome. Hello, thank you very much. Thanks for having me along. Yeah, my, my pleasure. So we're going to um, start with a little presentation um, from you, Mike. Yeah, you can sort of uh, tell us whatever you want uh, about the new guidebook and about Scottish winter climbing in general. And then we'll move on to some questions from myself and uh, and from the audience. Should we get straight to it, Mike? Hello, folks. Uh, yes, I've been going up and down Ben Nevis uh, uh, for a very long time. I've done it lots. So it is really really nice to be able to share some of that information with folks to try and help people just to uh to find the right route on the right day to get the most out of their climbing and to, to have more successes than failures i've had plenty of failures that's that's a lot of the a lot of how you learn stuff by trying working out stuff and sometimes it not going right if you can focus on why that worked out that way then then you learn so uh, i've been through that process a lot the, the types of climbs that we've got in this area, Glencoe and Ben Nevis and, and all the hills around about, right across Scotland, in fact, are so varied. There's there's all sorts of different climbs from ice climbs and mixed climbs and snow climbs. Uh, and in, in amongst all of those, there, there's lots of different types of ice and different factors that build a, a mixed climb. What, what I found was, um, for, for me, learning this whole game of going winter climbing, it's really quite hard to work out which climb, which type of climb to expect and also where to find that climb. You know, what kind, I, I specifically remember looking at one climb thinking, should it look like that or should it be a bit different? Is that is that right? Is that optimum condition or is that just a bit weird? I, I just don't know. When I was chatting with uh, many people that are just kind of learning the, the, the winter climbing craft, it's a, it's a similar kind of thing that, you know, I'll say, so where have you been? What, what have you been up to? And they say, well, we tried such and such a climb and that was good. But then we tried this other one and it was a nightmare. It was just terrible. I don't know what went wrong. And I was thinking, well, on that day, that, that was the wrong place to be, that, that kind of climb. So there's something that I now know after 22 years of doing this every single winter. I just wanted to find a way to get that across to people. Well, what is that information first? How can I present this to people to help them find the right route on the right day? So you can see lots of different types of climbs. There's cascade ice down there, there's snow ice higher up, there's mixed climbs, different types of mixed climbs. So the first thing was to try and um, categorise or, or describe the different styles of ice. So when, when we think of ice climbing on Ben Nevis, this is it. This is 0.5 Gully. This beautiful blue ice didn't start out as water. It starts out as snow. It, you know, the snow collected in the gully higher up was funneled down into the chimney, down into the, the rug pitch here and got stuck there. It then warmed up a little bit and the next bit of weather, as the weather changed over the next couple of days, the snow got soggy. And then when the temperature dropped again, that soggy snow turned into ice. When you repeat that process, lots and lots and lots of snowfall, thaw and then refreeze, you get this ice building up nicely in gullies like this. So the classic kind of ice that we talk about as just ice, 
is snow ice. It, uh, it started out as snow initially. So most of our climbs are, are like that. And that process, like I was saying, we need that bad weather. We need, need those storms to make those conditions to, to go through those cycles. But once we've endured enough of those cycles of uh, snowfall, thaw and refreeze, we get some ice in some wacky places. So this is uh, climbing out of the basin on Orion face. This is the second slab rib. It's part of the, the long climb finish to Orion direct. I'm lucky enough to have climbed that twice. <laughs> and I, I mean, really lucky. It's, uh, it's incredibly rare to have ice on that. And there's, there's no reason why ice should grow there. It's a slab of rock. There's no water dribbling down it. It's just through this process, enough of enough cycles of this snow thaw refreeze process that ice will form there if those cycles have just the right amount of snow and then thaw and then refreeze. So if we're really lucky, late on in the winter, we get some of these thin face climbs. So that was another category of climb, these thin face climbs. But you know, if you go elsewhere in the world and go ice climbing, it'll be cascade ice climbing up um, Finnescade Falls just at the side of uh, Ulrich Moor. It's about the same level as the, the top of the gondola at Nevis Range. It's about 600 meters above sea level. And it's just frozen water. It's, it, you, just, you just need a, a waterfall, persistent, very cold temperatures, and this ice, this cascade ice will form. So the kind of uh, conditions that you need to make this persistent cold with a water supply won't make that snow ice. It's persistent cold weather just doesn't make snow ice. You need that uh, snow thaw and refreeze conditions to make that and vice versa. So cascade ice was a, a different type of ice. So I thought those are the, most of the, uh, the types of ice climb that we get and the types of formation. When it comes to mixed climbing, well, here's Darth Vader, the cave on Darth Vader. And there's no ice there whatsoever. It's all just rock. It's a rocky mixed climb. To climb on, on the rocks like that, um, on this particular climb, you don't need any ice, but they, it does need to be frozen and it does need to be white. So these little icy crystals, these are crystals of rime ice. Now, rime ice forms very quickly. You can get this amount of rime ice forming just overnight in 12 hours. And I've seen that where it's been, the rocks have been black when I've walked out one day and I've gotten them back up the next morning, 12 hours later, and all the rocks are white down to the wind blowing the cloud onto the rocks when it's below freezing. And these, uh, these beautiful feathery crystals of rime ice growing into, into the wind. And that's the, the best kind of conditions for these, these rocky climbs. It's got to be frozen and, and solid, as in all the blocks frozen together, but then it can go white with this, uh, this um, rime ice. It takes a little bit longer for turfy mixed climbs. So right now I'm going climbing tomorrow and it's really early in the season. So I think what we'll be looking for is a rocky mixed climb because they form up really, really quickly. You don't need any ice. We haven't got any ice. It's too early in the season. So a rocky mixed climb will be just perfect. Something like Talibalan, it's really turfy. You can see great big dots of turf just above her there and further up in the, the chimney that we climbed. There's, there's massive lumps of turf right across this, this crag, which is in the Grey Corries, uh, Stokorin and Louis. Turf takes at least two weeks of really cold weather to freeze solid. Uh, so right now, this would be a horrible climb because those big lumps of turf just wouldn't be at all solid. So it's great to know which are the turfy climbs and which are the, the rocky climbs. But th actually, this climb is really interesting because higher up on it, uh, this corner that we climbed on the last pitch, it was all rock. This was in November, about four years ago. And I went back in late January in the same winter. So that kind of detail of uh, information is, is in this book. It talks about this one being a turfy mixed climb that then turns into an icy mixed climb. And crucially, you can climb it as either one. It doesn't really, it doesn't actually matter. For some mixed climbs, if there's ice on it, it's a nightmare. <laughs> you really don't want it. And on other mixed climbs, you really do want ice on it. So the icy mixed climbs is, a, is another category. Like this one here, this is uh, in Raven's Gully. Now this is a really icy mixed climb. Uh, don't go there when there's no ice. <laughs> you need lots of snow to build up and for it to turn into ice for that to be uh, much fun at all. So that's round on uh, Buchleta Moor in Glencoe. So there you go. D lots of different styles of climb, which in the book I've, I've tried to describe how each style of climb forms, what, what weather requirements you, you, you have to have to, to form each of those particular ingredients, like what you need to make rime, what you need to make the snow ice, and what time period, and all of those kind of things, so that um, when people come up here and go climbing, they can think, oh, what, what's the weather been like? What kind of things should I expect? So uh, for example, right now it is rocky mixed climbs that we're looking for. So, but which of those climbs? That was the next thing. So that's, that's what we've done with all of the climbs 
the, the climb symbols. Every climb has at least one of these these symbols to put it into a category, a style of climb. Uh, so the book is, is a little box that gives you some brief information about each crag and it tells you how to get there. Uh, but each of these routes has got these little um, these, these little uh, icons. So the secret there is a rocky mix climb. That kind of brown square with the ice axe in means it's a rocky mix climb. And cornucopia is just the same. So these are the kind of things that we think will be good to go tomorrow, we think. <laughs> but South Sea Bubble is an icy mix climb. It's a blue ice axe there. So just, just a, a very quick glance, we can go, all oh, right, so that's an icy mix climb. But given the weather that we've had, that's that's probably not going to be there. I don't think the ice has formed, so that's probably not going to be any good. And especially South Gully, that thing there, the circle means it's ice. That uh, blue figure inside means it's snow ice. That's not going to be there. We've not had the snow. We've not had any thaw freeze uh, cycles with lots of snow. So that's just, you know, not on the cards at all. So so just at a glance, you know, we can look through these routes and decide which uh, which one would be a good one to go for. Because, you know, once you start thinking about this, you still start thinking about particular routes that are really awkward. <laughs> and Lost the Place with, was one of those because it can be quite rocky mixed and it, it goes when it's just rocky mixed, but then also it can form some ice and it forms a very nice icy mixed climb. So I've put uh, that Lost the Place there can be an icy mixed climb or a rocky mixed climb. You don't have to have both. It can be one or the other. So it can be very good early in the season when there's no ice. And then later on, when there is ice, it's still very, very good. So, you know, there's that level of detail in there. Uh, so hopefully, I'm really interested to find out how this goes, because I, I don't think there's any guidebook out there with this level of information. There, there's other books describing types of climb and, and gives a, a few examples of those right across Scotland. And more of this information is coming out. But I think this is a lot of information in one guidebook that, well, hopefully will help people uh, find the right route on the right day and have more success. There you go. That's what we've got. Wow, Mike, that's um, uh, that's absolutely awesome. But it seems like complicated. Uh, I mean, it feels almost like you need to be a meteorologist or something to understand. How am I meant to like use this information to understand what conditions are going to be happening at the time? Therefore, what kind of style climb uh, should I be, be, be going for? What are the kind of the tools that I need? Yeah, so I think you're, you're totally right that we do need to be meteorologists, or at least we need to look at the weather. Uh, and, and, and you know, I think we're quite used to that as climbers, you know. Uh, I remember coming up, before I lived here, I remember coming up here, and I'll, I'll be looking at the weather forecast for weeks before I came up here, and the avalanche forecast, and trying to get some information just to see, you know, when, when it was snowing, when it was thawing, when it was freezing, what the temperatures were like, just to try and get an idea of that so i think we're quite used to that and you know generally people will be there the night before um going climbing just looking at all all that information so yes we've got lots of very good weather forecasts the met office does a brilliant high altitude forecast for for very specific mountains as well as the mountain weather information service and just by looking at these day by day by day you start to get a bit of an idea of exactly what's going on not just right now and, and for tomorrow but you know over the last couple of weeks or even months when it's later on in the winter. So it's, it's a, a very important thing to, to do that, as well as look at the Avalanche Information Service. So in, in terms of uh, going to the right place, definitely want to go somewhere where there's not a high chance of being avalanched, clearly. The, the, the primary function of that, uh, that service, but by reading it and by reading it in detail day after day after day, again, you get, you get to build this really good picture of how much snow there is and what's happened to it. You, you can get really geeky because on that uh, avalanche um, report, they'll put the results of the um, the pit test. So they, every day these people go out and dig pits down through the snow and they record what they see, all the different layers, the icy layers and the soft layers, and, and they put it there. That's that's out there to go and have a look at. So, you know, there, there is a vast amount of information there, as, as well as temperature recordings up at 1,200 metres at Nevis Range, at 900 metres and at 600 metres over the last two weeks you can look at all of that data so it's all the data is there but again if you don't know what the what that means you know if you don't know what will happen when the temperature spikes for two hours and then goes down again it's, it's kind of meaningless so that's where this book comes in you know this all it, it says about a thaw freeze cycle being very good and it also says about how long a thaw freeze uh, whether 12 hours is long enough or should it be a day or two days you know it describes all of those things so um, it will stay, will still take time. There's, there's, there's no doubt. There, there are so many factors. It will stay, take a long time to, uh, to really kind of get to grips with all of these different things and, and choose the best route every, 
well, I was going to say choose the best route every single day. That that still doesn't happen. <laughs> but you know, I've got far more chance of success these days. Yeah, that 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 all makes sense. And it's a good point. The the book does have. Um, I mean, you've included a good section in the introduction about how the conditions form and what the weather's doing that's separate to what these different styles of climbs are. I don't know. It sounds to me like looking maybe a couple of weeks ahead, maybe that's the kind of time where I should be starting looking at the weather and and uh, reading the avalanche information blogs and that sort of thing. Yes. Yep, exactly. That's yes, definitely. Um, and, and actually kind of a, a wee step before that, because if you're coming up now in December, there's only certain climbs that are ever going to be available. You know, there's there's never 0.5 gully just isn't going to be there. The, you know, mega root is, is never going to be there in December, I, I would say. You know, there's information about that, about the progression of the winter. So if you know you're coming up in a couple of weeks in, in December, you'll already you'll be kind of zoning in on a few types of climb to expect and, and certainly not quite a few others. Whereas if you come up at the end of February, well, it could be anything, you know, we could have all sorts of different things. And again, when you come up in April, uh, there's... Uh, far more chance that um, there's going to be really good ice, but not a lot of chance of rime being forming up on the on the rocks. So mixed climbs, rocky mixed climbs just won't be very good. It just sounds like it's all really in the, in the planning stage. And I think that's something that when I was personally starting getting into winter climbing that I didn't realise that that was a part of the process. I've got some, some more questions that I want to ask you about gear and kit and sort of the, the, the how to avoid the misery side of things but uh, we'll, we'll get to that first I just wanted to um, uh, just say thanks to Nathan for uh, his question he says that the book looks amazing thanks Nathan um, his question is that whether you've got any advice on getting back to winter climbing after this long summer season off and you know how to be fit and ready to climb and and mentally fit too so what I do to prepare is just well yeah to stay fit you, you've done that absolutely Absolutely. Go running, go biking, make sure your cardiovascular is good and you've, you've been out on some good, good long days. I mean, walking, walking in the mountains in the autumn is wonderful. It's quite burly, you know, with some, some uh, quite intense weather. It can be just fantastic and it's, it's setting you up well. I will also remind you about, yeah, how, how to look after yourself, how to stay warm and dry and comfortable in those difficult conditions. So it's well worth doing all of that. And, and yes, of course, go to the climbing wall, but do, do try and dangle on your ice axes if you can. If there's any dry tooling at the climbing wall, some climbing walls have got some dry tooling that you're allowed to do. There are one or two crags um, coming up in, in certain, certain areas where you can go dry tooling. Um, don't just go dry tooling anywhere, folks. It's got to be at the right place where it's generally kind of accepted that it's okay to do that. And that's really handy because it does feel weird dangling on your ice axes. And if you've just been doing a little bit of that, it does feel a lot better when you first get out and uh, and do it for real on a, on a winter climb. So. Yeah, stay fit, get get uh, get ready for it, and um, yeah, do some dangling on your ice axes. Practice putting your crampons on at home before you. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I mean, if, if you're like me at the at the last climb at the end of the last winter, we'll have we'll been just like, oh, that was fantastic. Put those in the cupboard, forget about them, and then you know, I just got mine out today. You think I'm going climbing tomorrow? Ah, my crampons, they're still blunt as anything. I need to sharpen those. I need to check the bolts on my ice axes. You know, I could have done that straight months ago, but you know. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned to me recently about that we don't want it to snow right now. That sounds, um, probably sounds quite, quite counterintuitive to a lot of people. Surely it's winter climbing. Surely we want it to snow right now. Uh, no, not not right, not not straight away. First off, you want the ground to cool down. Uh, we've had winters where the snow just arrived straight away, and so much snow came that it didn't ever melt off. The ground didn't really cool down. There, there's a strange thing about snow; it's actually quite insulating from from the air. With that layer of snow, it doesn't matter how cold it is, the the, the air temperature, it's not really going to freeze the ground very well afterwards. And there was one winter I can't remember, like seven or eight winters ago. We had so much snow. It was it was phenomenal, the amount of snow. The avalanches were, were quite incredible. But I remember climbing Observatory Ridge and right up high, about 1,300 metres in February, there was so much snow I had to dig down through this to find a rock to find some kind of an anchor. And it was all just loose and rubbly. Still, it wasn't frozen, but the ground underneath just hadn't frozen. And it didn't freeze all winter, really, in, in lots of places. Uh, so then when it came to the um, to the spring, the snow melted away super quickly because underneath the ground was relatively warm. And, and that's the thing that in a shorter cycle, if you get snow straight away before the ground has cooled down, it's gonna melt away far quicker than if the ground has cooled down to start off with. 
So you want you want the ground to freeze so that it's solid, so we can climb the turf <laughs> when it's not mushy. You want it frozen solid, and then when the snow comes, the snow's going to hang around for much longer because it's not going to be melted from underneath, if you like, the, when, when the ground is cold. Makes sense now you explain it. <laughs> People talk about climbing on Ben Nevis in sort of almost mythical terms. For those people that listening that may not have climbed on the Ben, what's so special about it? So, oh man, where do you start? <laughs> I think my, my, much of it is, is that challenge. So, the, and the challenge comes in lots of different ways. So, so yes, the grade, of course, yes, but it's the style as in the overall style, the traditional style of UK climbing that there's not fixed protection. We don't bolt climbs. We don't have fixed belays on, on most of the climbs. There are, there are a few kind of aging, rusting pegs in place on some of the belays. Of course there are, yes. Uh, but you know, generally the ethic is to keep our crags and our mountains as clean of, of all that infrastructure as possible. So, uh, so you're always in for quite an adventurous climb. And also because of the ephemeral nature of it, because it does change so much, the conditions, the weather, change the climbing conditions so much that it's, 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 it's quite hard to be in the right place at the right time. So therefore, when you are in the right place at the right time and you get that wonderful moment when, they, when everything just aligns beautifully, it's, it's just such a phenomenal experience. Absolutely wonderful. So it's a big, big experience in a relatively small package. I mean, Ben Nevis is not high compared to the Alps or the Caucasus or mountains kind of elsewhere in the world. You know, they're, they're, they're tiny. So we get some visitors from abroad coming here going, oh, what is this? Is. This is not very big. This is, cannot be very good. But, you know, then they experience the weather and the and the conditions and the, the runouts and the, you know, just the all those uncertainties. And, uh, and when they learn to cope with all of that and manage all of that, the, the experience is, um, is far, far more profound, I would say. Yeah. Isn't there like a French guide, language guidebook for Ben Nevis or something? Yeah, so Godfrey know. Peru. Yes. Yeah. He, he came here, uh, a French mountain guide, Godfrey Peru, came here for many, many years, uh, bringing uh, his the, the French uh, customers over. He would stay at the CRC hut for, for a few weeks cooking them all sorts of fancy food, you know, crepe and all sorts of wonderful things. So it's a really good vibe, you know. And, uh, yeah, re really um, liked uh, as a person, as a, as a climber coming over here. Um, he was um, very highly thought of. And, um, yeah, it would be a you know, fantastic experience for somebody in France to come over to Scotland and experience Ben Nevis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. We have this habit in um, of, in Scottish winter climbing of uh, climbing when the weather is really bad that you don't seem to do that often in uh, in Europe or in, uh, in the US. I guess it's because we don't really have that many days where the weather might be perfect and the conditions might be perfect at the same time. Is that generally why we just accept that it's fine to go climbing in a snowstorm? Uh, yes, that's one reason. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, we just kind of uh, muscle up and get on with it. <laughs> and uh, because half the time when you go out in those pretty rubbish conditions, you can actually get some very good climbing done. Or you go out expecting it to be pretty horrible and the weather forecast wasn't quite right. It turns out kind of all right, you know. Um, those unexpectedly good days uh, are, are lovely, you know. They're like a bonus. You're expecting to be pummeled all day and actually you kind of, you go, oh, well, that's actually all right. Uh, so you get some really good uh, days that way. Uh, but also, so and out in the out in the Alps, you've got some um, different hazards. So if you're up high, you've got glaciers to deal with, with crevasses and far bigger slopes in terms of uh, avalanche uh, hazard, that can be a, a big problem, Seracs. Uh, so moving around on glaciated ter terrain when you can't see very well is really challenging. It's, it's very dangerous. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong. So uh, out in the Alps, it tends to be that if the weather is that bad, you just can't find your way across the glacier. You just tend not to do it. So you end up going out on the sunny days, which there are many in the Alps. I mean, there are many horrible days as well, but there, there are, I think there are more sunny days than we have over here, that's for sure. Uh, so it's, it kind of feels like, well, you only go out on the sunny days out in the Alps because of those objective dangers. Whereas here, yeah, if you just go out on the sunny days, you might get four or five days of climbing each winter. So uh, you just gonna have to go out and, uh, and learn it. And, and it's part of it, you know, when you can, manage that weather and the really challenging conditions just you know keeping your fingers warm keeping yourself warm and comfortable uh, and keeping going navigating finding your way around in, in those really challenging conditions it's, it provides its own satisfaction it's a it's a skill to learn it's a craft to develop 
But once you've got that, oh, it feels brilliant, very rewarding. Now I'm in front of this fountain of knowledge um, that you are, Mike. Uh, I'm thinking about times where I've climbed and the weather, I feel like the weather has meant that the routes that we've chosen to do have not been the right ones. It's not necessarily that it was ter terrible weather, but it maybe felt like it was the wrong weather for that particular route. For example, it might it's sometimes fine to go climbing when it's snowing or when it's windy. But I uh, remember an experience on, I think, Italian right hand on Ben Nevis, where it was blowing snow upwards at us and um, we couldn't see anything at all. And then it would stop doing that and it would blow snow straight, uh, straight down. It was pretty difficult to um, make progress, let alone see your hands uh, on the Iraq season point of view. So I'm guessing that was just the wrong route for that weather that day. So I, I shouldn't laugh, but it's only, I'm only laughing because I've been there. I've done exactly that. Those, those days when the spindrift comes down on top of you first and then gets blown back up here and then falls down a third. <laughs> so it goes past you three times. It doesn't yeah, seem those fair. Days. <laughs> it's, it's not fair. It's definitely not fair. It shouldn't happen, but it does. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so, so maybe uh, a buttress climb where there's going to be less spin drift, you know, the, the funnel effect of, of the gullies. And yeah, okay, Italian right hand isn't much of a gully, but higher up there's a gully that then kind of pours everything down on top of you there. So if you can avoid the gullies, then, then you're going to have far less spin drift. We've, we've had another question from uh, from James, and uh, James basically stole one of my questions, so it's really it's really relevant uh, uh, to me anyway. James says, uh, thanks for the super talk. The guidebook looks great. Can I ask about the balance between training and experience? I'm looking to progress into climbing grade six, grade seven, and I'm wondering whether I should prioritize mileage and experience, i.e. getting out as much as possible, or whether dry tooling and other training becomes quite important at this level too. I would say winter specific training from kind of grade six, grade seven, about where you're getting to there is very useful. Definitely. If you want to progress beyond grade seven, you're really going to have to do some quite specific to, uh, training on, on tools. So that's, yeah, that's dry tooling, that's pull ups and all sorts of things just, just on your tools. So definitely do some of that from, from that kind of grade six, seven kind of as you progress up the way, uh, the specific training is good. Before that, really, it's just days out learning your craft and, and learning all those little things. I mean, it, it, it seems daft, but all sorts of little things about how to stay warm and dry and comfortable. There, there are loads of little little tips that will work for you that might not work so well for me. But, you know, each one of us learns our own system, our own formula for how we can stay warm and dry. And that is, is such a crucial thing. Not just that, but staying comfortable in terms of being relaxed on the uh, on the cliff, on the climb that you're on. So. Uh, both of those things take quite a lot of mileage, uh, just just being out in all sorts of different weather, all sorts of different conditions and, and learning all of those things. But, you know, being being really quite focused on those. So, you know, learn ways to keep your hands dry and warm. What type of gloves have you got? What do you wear underneath? How do you layer up? How do you keep them dry when you're on? You know, I, I, I've, I've gone through a, a good number of gloves in my life. The search for the perfect glove is, is never ending, I think. But I'm, I'm kind of getting better. But some of those, it's some of the gloves in my arsenal are rubber gloves, you know, like industrial gloves that you might use in a, a fish packing kind of factory, you know, marine what harvest. Do you, what do you use like them for? I'll use them when I go climbing because when it's wet, you know, on those wet days, they are the only thing that's going to keep me dry and comfortable. You know, they're, they're rubbish for wiping snot off your nose, but they're brilliant for keeping your hands dry. So, uh, and they are just, you know, proper rubber gloves. So, you know, that's, I, I tried out these like 25 years ago. I was like, I wonder if you could use rubber gloves. And they've come on so much now. There's uh, there's some really specialist glove manufacturers that produce like 400 different types of gloves. It's well, well, good research, good research, well worth looking into, you know. Uh, so, uh, so mileage for you know all the way up to you know three, four, five, grade six. Uh, just you know consolidate your grade. Don't be thinking that once you've done two grade fives, ah, uh -huh, you're ready for a grade six. You know, don't do lots of different grade fives, lots of different styles of climb, lots of grade fives in different weather and you know even the same climb on different days will be very very different and every time you do it you'll just learn something you learn something about the conditions and how to climb it how to protect it 
and you become comfortable in, in all those different things so that when you nudge the grade up the way, that bank of experience is, is there for you and will really help you up, uh, nudge up the way to the next grade. So mileage counts for a, a lot. Yeah, I hope that uh, I hope that helps, James. That's uh, that's helped me. We've got a question from uh, uh, Jonathan uh, again. He says, "What's the best approach for the Ben this winter?" I think, presumably, by approach, Jonathan, you mean um, the way of appro- uh, getting okay. to getting to the crag. What's I mean? There's a bunch of ways that you can that you can approach the. Um, yeah, so on, it, it's a thing that um, it's going to be a little bit tricky this winter. Forestry and Land Scotland in the past was very good in allowing us to drive up through the forest if you you know if you wanted to invest in the the access permission and the key that would would let you go up to the the top car park. Now they're doing forestry work. There's uh, the, the felling, clear felling, the top of that forest above Torlundi. So nobody's going to be driving up. Everybody's going to be starting from North Face Car Park and North Face Car Park. There, there were problems with just the, the, the number of people coming and using that car park, uh, and more especially the the track on the way down. It got blocked a couple of times. There was uh, some um, kind of inconsiderate parking. So you can't park on the track anymore. We've just got North Face Car Park. So on busy weekends, it's going to get full. It's, it's going to get full really early. So that could be a problem. So there are other places you can start from town just you know if you go and park at Marks and Spencers it's, what, what a place to go and start a day in winter climbing let's go to Marks and Spencers uh, but there's, there's a car park there you can walk out past the the smelter the aluminium smelter and up the big track uh, that leads into the uh, the Alta Vuden path from there much further from Nevis range but you could start from there you could ride your bike up through the the, the forest tracks um, to, to help out with that but I think, yeah, I think that's probably what the, the question is about there. North Face Car Park is still there. It's still fine. But I think on those really busy weekends, it is going to get really busy. So and as in the car parks can get full of cars. So, yeah, on those weekends, just maybe get there really early or think about one of these one of these others. Are there ever times where, Mike, you would choose to start from the Glen Nevis side and, and walk over past the, uh, the Lochan? Or would, is that just for if you fancy a longer walk? Uh, mostly that, but it does work fine. It's the traditional approach. You know, there's still, uh, you know, for Carnwall, Jadagoret, there are still many descriptions saying to start from there, go over the shoulder and down. It's actually a little bit tricky because on, on that shoulder, if it's really snowy quite low down, the shoulders you go around from the halfway lock and in, in towards the Alta Vuda can cornice. It can collect quite a bit of snow. It's a bit awkward to locate and, and the path can get covered in snow. So it's actually not such a great way in. So probably stick with the, the other side. Uh, walking up from Torlundi somewhere. Good, uh, good tip. I think probably last question that we've sort of really got time for. It's one. It's just one from me, and I just wanted to ask you kind of how you felt about this. Um, we're about to publish this eighth edition uh, of uh, of the book. The, the first edition of this was published in 1969. That was, that was uh, Ian Clough, wasn't it? It was Ian Clough. Yeah. Um, we made the first descent of Point Five Gully. It's amazing. Amazing. So uh, the books had authors and revisers, yeah, with names like Ian Clough, uh, Hamish McInnes revised the second edition, Alan Kimber. I guess I just wanted to ask, how does that sort of feel to you? Almost like I don't belong there, I must admit, you know, because that's that a phenomenal uh, list of names that you just read out. And Ed Grinley did one as well. Don't don't forget him. He's, uh, you know, all of these people are ab- absolutely phenomenal in, in what they contributed to to climbing, to, to mountain culture. You know, Hamish McInnes is a, a to- was a, a, a total legend and his contribution to all sorts of things, to mountain rescue, the Search and Rescue Dogs Association, uh, to climbing skills, the, the number of books he's written, the films he's written is, you know, a phenomenal character. So, yes, I, I feel very honoured to be kind of associated in, in that group of people and very grateful to Alan Kimber, who, you know, approached me many years ago and said, uh, would I consider taking on um, on the book? Now he did three revisions of it, and um, you know laid laid the ground brilliantly. So I'm, I'm very grateful to him to uh, to pass it on to me. Oh, you're, you're totally deserving of it, Mike. Of course, and that, 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 um, I mean you've done an amazing job with the book. But that kind of handing things over and sort of uh, the the long term ownership or uh, of a of a book um, is something that kind of it features in quite a lot of Cicerone books. Is this sort of handing things on? Um, I, I really like that about the book. So no, I think you've done a, an amazing job with the book. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm so interested in, in how it goes. It, it is a you know it's this uh yeah I'm just interested whether people find this useful this this new approach to to, to the information that's in there. So I really I really hope so. And I'm very keen for feedback as well. So uh, once people have the book in their hands and they're out climbing, you know, I'd love to know 
uh, what people's experiences are, whether it's useful, whether it can be tweaked or developed or or whether it's a load of rubbish. <laughs> I don't know. I think it'll be useful. I can only think it'll be useful, but I'd love to know people's experience. That's uh, great to put out that call for feedback. Yeah, we'd love to hear it, whether it's to you or to Cicerone. Like, yeah, use the book, tell us what you think, and we'll um, we'll um, we'll see what we can do for, for next time around as well. Absolutely. Great. Mike, um, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your um, unbelievable knowledge uh, with us. Uh, it's been, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Please email live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, come and find us on our social channels. We're on all the main ones as at Cicerone Press and we also have a Facebook group, Cicerone Connect, where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you soon.